Well, we're into December, and Christmas will be different this year than probably ever before, unless we had a snow day on Christmas, which we had in 2009. But uh, this is a continuation of the faith chapter in Hebrews. My messages seem to always be God is looking for a people with faith. And as we look at the men of old and what God was showing his favor to, that's kind of where we're continuing and moving in toward Christmas. There's nothing greater than us being the people God wants us to be this Christmas, people of faith. And I'm in the 11th chapter of Hebrews in the 8th verse. And again, in the past few weeks, we've dealt with Enoch. We've dealt with Noah. And today I want to look at Abraham. And these are the lineage that God has chosen from the human race to perpetuate faith in God. Um, we are not just in this world uh, by coincidence and uh, we're trying to make the best of what we have. This world was created by God for us to be the people of faith for God. And uh, we're looking at what God had to do to remedy the fallen condition of man. Man seeking his own way, doing his own thing, not being concerned with godliness, uh, God's will. And that's what we try to look here at Abraham. And, and I'm taking this from Hebrews because this is a consolidation of the Bible in looking at history and how mankind has viewed Abraham historically. This is a book of history, but it's the history that God wants brought forth, not the history of man and man's doing. So, we start with verse 8 that says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. And I said, Faith is the evidence of things not seen. And Abraham was the first of his race to, in a sense, beyond Noah, to hear God's voice and direction. And Abraham had to consider what God's purpose was in having him be singled out of all people on the earth. And I, I'm still reminded of Romans 12, 1 and 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that good and perfect will of God. And this is what Abraham had to search out. Is this in relationship to what he had known about God? And that was where I believe Abraham sat and pondered upon his hearing the voice of God, however one hears the voice of God, whether it was audible or an intuitive thought that he had. Maybe this is God. God's telling me to get up and go, but yet I didn't hear his verbal words. It was just in my heart I knew what I needed to do. And it says, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So I don't know how much overlap there was when Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, I think Abraham had died 
of course, before Jacob came in to the picture, but he dwelt in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. And again, this is probably 200 years worth of history in that passage that we just read. But then he goes on to say, for he waited for the city which has foundations. He, he was living in a tent and he didn't set up camp until he knew that he was in the perfect will of God. He waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. If there never was to be an earthly sanctuary or an earthly place, then he knew that there was a place that God had built for him. Then it, it jumps in Hebrews to bring Sarah, and I mentioned last week that from the human perspective, women have been subjected to terrible status in the world. And Christ, I believe, has elevated woman, Mary, the mother of God. That's what the church has called her. And so the church has elevated woman. And apart from Christianity, the woman would still be subservient to the man. But Christ looked ahead at the human being, being male and female, that they are one and the same. And here, I believe Sarah was elevated to the place that her seed was going to be the redemption of the human race. And again, I said the seed is not from a woman. And so here it says, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age. Sarah was a hundred years old, 99 years old. And, and beyond the birth age normally of a woman, because she judged him faithful who had promised. God had promised to Abraham, his seed, and his seed was in a sense like God's seed. There's in Abraham's history, we'll look at briefly, the seed of Abraham was essential for the redemption of the human race. And therefore from one man and him as good as dead, from Abraham and Sarah who were beyond the age of bearing children, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. The writer of Hebrews goes on to sort of draw Abraham into a hole. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That's sort of where we are. We're looking to the city, to heaven, that is to be. Here on earth, we aren't sure what's going on in this world, but our home is not here. We are resident aliens passing through and truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. As we have made ourselves resident aliens here, we don't look back from where we came and said, well, I'm going to go back to Egypt. I'm going to go back to Ur of Chaldeas. There looks to be more promise there. No, they set their eyes on something beyond where they came from. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. We are all passing through. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
all of us today who are Christians. Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and that by faith in him, we too are looking at that home. Hebrews goes on to, again, I, I'm covering a lot of territory in the book of Hebrews as far as generations and time. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Abraham had waited his whole life for Sarah to bring forth a son. When the son was born to Sarah, there was no mistaking that this was the promise of God. That Abraham went through many trials and tests to prove that he was the man of God. That the promises of God for the human race were to come through him. Of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. So Abraham knew the word of God. In Isaac, your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. And this is one of the most courageous acts of faith that there really is. For Abraham to wait his whole life to put his eyes upon Isaac, the child of promise. Through him and his seed, all people on earth would be blessed. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Now, this was a strange blessing, and it, it was not quite understood why Esau was brought into the picture here, but as I looked into this, I could see God's word, his blessing was upon Abraham and upon his seed. Now, that seed went to Hagar, the handmaid of Sarah, and she conceived and bore Ishmael. But he was not the child of promise. But in Abraham's disobedience, the word of God had, was upon him. And, and this, is a, this is a beautiful, we don't realize the power of our words, the power of our action, the power of things that we see and do. But here, Abraham tried to help God out. Well, Sarah looked at it as though, hey, I'm going to give you my handmaid. Maybe if she conceives, he'll have the child of promise. But God did not choose Hagar to be the mother of the seed that God was going to bless the world with. It had to come through Sarah. And Sarah was, by faith, I mean, to believe that you're going to have a child at the age of 100, it, it takes a lot of faith. And that's what she did. But her disobedience and Abraham's disobedience brought about some problems for God pertaining to his promises. Your seed, well, his seed was cast into the wrong vessel and it conceived Ishmael. And the blessing of God was not on Ishmael, but it was upon the seed of Abraham. And today, many nations call Abraham their father. And at first I thought, how can they do that when the Jews are the children of God? But here Ishmael and his seed of Abraham conceived and God blessed him. We'll look at that later. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning on the top of his staff. Now, I'm not going to preach on Jacob at this time, but that staff of God is very important pertaining to God's blessings and callings and promises not understood by all. 
By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. So these words and these blessings by faith were a continuation of the plan of salvation for the human race. No different than Adam telling Cain and Abel and Seth what happened in the fall and what God had revealed to them about the shedding of the animals and in redemption and, and the atoning power in the sacrifices that were to be made. And only those who worshiped God with the blood of the animal or the sacrifice was it acceptable to God. And so here you see in these words of faith, it's all tied with the promises of God toward redemption, towards salvation, towards the coming of the Son of God. And that came through Israel. And as Joseph mentioned, I want my bones. I'm in Egypt. When we leave here, take my bones to the promised land. The promise is yet to come. For 400 years, Israel remained in Egypt, and they grew strong. And as we approach Christmas, we want to keep in mind that history is his story. This is the development of the plan of God for salvation to the world. We celebrate Christmas with the Advent wreath, this sermon is the advent of Christ, the coming of Christ in preparation for him, in preparation for the salvation of the world. No other message in the world can bring salvation or redemption but the message of Jesus Christ, which came through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was from Israel, of the tribe of Judah, of the blessings of David, all pertaining to that city which we look forward to seeing. So in preparation for Christmas and our sermon next week, I'm going to be talking about Egypt and Israel coming out of Egypt and Moses and his preparation for Israel to be the birth mother of the Messiah in whom we celebrate this season that we're about to come upon. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you so much that even COVID and all of its downsides, Lord, it may draw America and the world to its Savior. There is no redemption. There is no salvation apart from Christ. And Lord, we feel his return is imminent. As we stand at the bedside and uh, view a patient who is given the doctor's uh, statement that he's, his death is imminent, that means that death can come at any time. And we feel the same way, Lord. Your return is imminent. We don't know at what time you will come, but we know that in this time, we're preparing our hearts for the coming of the Son of Man, for Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Hear these words, O Lord as together we pray that prayer that the church was given to restrain Satan. And so, Lord, by faith we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen.